So we're very excited to present the um, kind of first results of this phase two study at this meeting. So this is a very novel phase two study and it's really looking at the concept of what's the best way to treat patients who are taking ibrutinib who have developed molecular resistance to the point where you know they're going to develop progressive disease or they have a known resistance mutation and have progressive disease. Um, currently the standard would be to switch them to venetoclax which is continuous monotherapy looks to have a progression free survival of about two years medium. So the concept is can you add venetoclax to people with these mutations that either haven't developed progressive disease yet to avoid relapse or who have to see if you can get a really deep remission and eliminate the residual leukemia and allow them to discontinue therapy and remission um, and enjoy some time off treatment as opposed to continuous monotherapy treatments with different targeted agents. Um, the kind of rationale for this is venetoclax um, has efficacy after ibrutinib as demonstrated in a phase two study specifically in this population. So it's the most effective approved drug in this setting. Although I'm gonna to have to think about that now because uh, the non-covalent BTK inhibitor pertubrutinib just got um, approved in the United States. Um, and uh, also decreases the allelic frequency of known BTK mutations. The one everyone thinks of the most prevalent one is the BTK C41S mutation. So we thought maybe this will kind of target the um, resistant clone uh, because you see the allelic frequency of these mutations decrease and is very effective after ibrutinib. And of course we know the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax is both highly effective and very tolerable in other settings. So the idea was you have people taking ibrutinib who develop molecular resistance with or without progressive disease, add in venetoclax with a standard ramp up and then at the label dose of 400 milligrams, and then after 12 cycles, which is a little less than a year, do an assessment, and if they have undetectable CLL and have a complete remission, stop treatment and observe them. They don't achieve the response, do another 12 cycles, and then after 24 cycles, if they achieve that response, discontinue. If they do not, stop ibrutinib and just continue a venetoclax, because probably the benefit to the combination isn't really realized by that point. Um, so that's kind of the scheme of the study, and we included 28 patients. Some of the patients um, are still on treatment, so I do think longer follow-up will be helpful, but we're very excited about the um, results, not only with the responses achieved, um, but also the progression-free survival. So the median progression-free survival with this approach is 40.7 months, which is longer than the, you know, around uh, two years you would expect with venetoclax monotherapy. Of course, we are catching people before they have progressive disease in many cases. Um, but then, on the other hand, we have people who are off therapy enjoying remission. So that's really exciting. The overall survival was not reached, which is really important. Um, when you think about what's happening with the mutations, we did have about two-thirds of the patients have an undetectable BTKC41S mutation. We had one patient that didn't ever have a BTKC41S mutation, but of those that did, um, about two-thirds became negative for those mutations. So they actually had them eliminated, um, and the, the median time to do that was seven cycles, cycles of 28 days. So it really is showing that this concept of that you can eliminate resistant clones or at least suppress them below the detection limit. Um, and then you know the rate of minimal residual disease uh, was substantial. So it's kind of showing you can actually get deep remissions with the strategy of an add-on of venetoclax rather than switching to a different monotherapy. Um, just uh, towards my point that the therapy works, um, we did have 43% of patients that discontinued due to the achieved response, either a complete remission with non-detectable disease or some that elected to discontinue with a um, partial remission with no detectable disease and one person with a complete remission with some detectable CLL. So that's a high number of people who achieved kind of a goal response and could be off treatment. Um, I do think that we've you know got a reasonable analysis of the BTKC41S mutations where we have a really good assay that you can get very um, uh, even low levels of it detectable. We need to make sure we understand what happens to the other mutations patients had. So about 40% of patients at time of enrollment had only um, BTKC41S mutations, but we did have some that had both BTK and PLC gamma 2 or multiple types of BTK mutations. So trying to understand what happened with those will be critical. And then continuing to see the experience of patients, how long people can be off treatment, and then at some point uh, when we have enough follow-up doing an exploratory analysis, 
of those that entered the study with low disease versus a higher disease burden, um, just to describe uh, if there are any differences between those patients. So uh, this is not a strategy that I'm proposing could be implemented in a general practice setting, um, but it's certainly very exciting to see these really nice responses, um, durable benefit, and time off treatment in a population of people who have molecular resistance in their CLL to ibrutinib and would expect to get continuous treatment. Um, so I think the, the concept of us doing this, we've shown that that is the case, and we just need to do uh, some more work to understand this uh, better.